Moving on to the next technical presentation by architect Swapnil Patil. He is an urban designer with a background in architecture from University of California, USA. He has worked for over 13 years in USA, China and Dubai in designing township plans, community master plans. He has also served as an advisor to the government of Abu Dhabi in formulating its vision. After return, returning back to India, he is serving as a director of Berry Urban and Environmental Planners. They have won a prestigious National Hadko Award for the most innovative township design in India for the year 2013. He is currently working on a very exciting development model to create India's first fully organized, planned and developed uh, agricultural urbanism, which is centered around food and nature in all aspects such as organizing, growing, processing, distributing, cooking and eating. Permaculture, okay. that's what I think. So presenting to you, Architect Sapnil Patil. Thank you for that kind introduction, Smita. Um, special thanks to I, uh, Sangli, um, Architect Chogule, Management Committee, and everybody. It's an incredible honor to be at this event. Um, I also see many familiar faces in the audience, so that kind of makes it more at home kind of event. Um, I've been presenting at several forums. Uh, I've been presenting myself at several forums, and oftentimes, you know, these are uh, policy think tanks. Um, uh, there are developers and uh, uh, regulatory guys, and so on and so forth. Today is different. This is the first time, you know, you could say that uh, you're sort of presenting at Indian Institute of Architects Convention, and that makes it challenging because we all are architects. I believe we all are highly opinionated, you know, we have our own strong views, uh, so on and so forth. So anything that I speak today about architecture perhaps would just be pandering, you know, it is, it would be something that you may have already heard about. Uh, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus more on uh, the aspects of master planning and community design. And uh, so, um, I'll just keep moving around because I have to point at a few things. But as a master planner, traditionally what we do is mostly to do with the future. Um, uh, so in that sense, some of you may really say that I'm an expert in future, and in planning terms when we say future, it's really five year, 10 year, 15 year, sometimes 20 year time horizon that we're looking at. Unlike uh, you who are experts in present, when you plan a building, you plan it for one year, two years, so on and so forth. Uh, but when you plan with such a long-term horizon, what's important is that, you know, you don't plan that 15 years, 20 years down the line what the individual buildings would look like or what the aesthetics would look like or what the architecture would look like. What you really start to focus upon is the communities, you know, the building blocks of the society, how the city would grow, how the communities would grow, and what kind of lifestyle we would be able to afford. And that's what the, the uh, presentation that we're going to look at is today. And um, this is an interesting slide. You know, if you look at the context in which we live today um, uh, and start to look at it sequentially, what's happening is that due to the increased opportunities, there's a large scale urbanization that's happening as a result of which our infrastructure is crumbling, as a result of which, you know, our entire lifestyle is getting altered. You know, the, uh, I mean, whether it's an affordability issue, whether the kind of housing that we have, the housing choices we have, the kind of neighborhoods we live into, all that is deteriorating. And the lack of quality of life is something, you know, that's going to have direct impact on the kind of communities that we create. So today what is happening is that we are developing individual housing projects, which may be brilliant by itself, but there's, there's no cohesiveness to it. What is more important is that we need to start thinking about more cohesive urban societies and more of as a community in, and, and several ways in which it can be developed. Uh, and that brings us to the root question that what is community anyway? I mean, if you go strictly by the Webster's uh, definition, community is a place where we all live in harmony with our neighbors, we have an access to nature, there's parks and open spaces, all within walking distance, you know, so you don't have to get into your car and move to those places. There are multiple choices when it comes to your daily needs, such as buying your groceries, dropping off your kids to schools, and so on and so forth. And that's the kind of thing that we all recognize as a community. 
And what is happening uh, in today's time is somehow that sense of community is kind of getting diminished uh, every single day. And it is important to understand why that is happening. I mean, uh, one of the tools that we often use as urban designer master planners is that we use a lot of these kind of diagrams uh, because uh, drawings are the best form of communication. So we use a lot of diagrams to communicate our ideas. And this is the conventional model of our development, the way we see them today. You know, typically there's a, there's a main arterial road or like a main road that we call about a street of which, you know, there's a commercial frontage because it's a, it's a precious land. And then what we have is uh, disparate and disconnected neighborhoods and more with, with uh, roads, you know, that sort of lead to nowhere. There are these dead ends. Uh, the leftover space where we cannot build becomes a park. And then the school and other public amenities are located somewhere in isolation. Uh, I think where we are trying to look at is a community-based model of development. And the way that model works is simply very simple. When I say we, let me be very clear about it that I'm not claiming to be an innovator. You know, none of the master planners, urban designers can do that because in reality, this is how our forefathers used to build. If you try to remember all our memorable cities, towns, villages, there was a certain charm about those towns, you know, in which they were built. It's only in today's world we've started losing that essence. So what we simply do is that we go back to the history, we study those elements, we try and bring them back. And this is a, con uh, a community-based model in which there's an arterial, as soon as you enter, there's a commercial center and there's a park. Now, the park becomes the place-making element. I mean, we all are architects here, so it's very... I mean, I need not say the importance of place-making. And, and the circles, these dotted circles that you see, are actually what we call pedestrian shades. These are 20-minute walking distances. So what that means is that all the people who live here within the community have a 20-minute access to a commercial center. There's a centrally located park. And on the main avenue, there's a school which acts as this terminating element, the way our old palaces, old structures used to act as a focal point. Uh, and then the entire community is sort of an interconnected network of street. Uh, and then these are the typical ingredients that go into um, making community. We all, all the time do these kind of simple, sketchy diagrams. In some sense, these are really cartoons. We don't, we don't get to that highly uh, rendered CGI AutoCAD model because the whole idea is that while we are doing this, it's also important that we educate our, our stakeholders, uh, our developers, our, our people who are involved. So we have to make this really, really simplistic. Uh, and, and the core ingredients of a good community is that you've, you've got a very robust transit line, so you have a transportation network from where uh, the bus or the transit line stops. From there you walk and then there are your day-to-day -day needs located in terms of retail, mixed use along the ground. There are parks and open spaces all within that walking distance. There's variety of housing type. Now it's very important to emphasize on this word variety because a good community a good, good city is something where there's a diversity. You know, there's a diversity of housing types, there's diversity of income levels, there's people from different walks of life. We cannot just afford to create gated communities which are ultra premium and then, you know, so-called affordable Mahara kind of housing, you know. It's very important to integrate all these elements together. Uh, and then what, as I said earlier, is that we start to look at community blocks uh, or, or the building blocks of a community design. Uh, and as I said earlier, these are what we call traditional neighborhood design principles, T and D. And these are simply taken from the history. You know, we don't claim to be innovative. We don't want to be innovative. In fact, that's the whole problem with the world that everybody, when this uh, starts being innovative, what you get is brilliant individual icons or, you know, architectural buildings, elements, which are great by themselves, but when you put them in a backdrop, they all fall because, you know, they are like individual museum pieces. So what, what is important is to start looking at these principles that go on to develop a community. And I'm going to go real quick and, you know, touch upon each one of these individually. And the first principle that we uh, typically look at is that you got a 200 acre, 4,000 acre site, you know, a, a very large canvas. What is important is that, how do you address that sort of canvas? And we start with the first principle, which is divide the site into series of neighborhoods to create communities. 
on the left hand side what you see is is a simple diagram and on right hand side what i'm showing is how we do that and and it's important to understand that what you see is a site boundary and you use this could be major avenues major streets green corridors or pathways you use these boundaries you know to create these whatever 1 2 3 4 5 6 different neighborhoods and and the interpretation of that is that once you create did an individual neighborhood it becomes an important element the basic dna of that particular uh, community the next principle is that we develop an interconnected network of streets the word is interconnected what that means is that you know it's the cities are or the communities are just like human bodies you know you got a choked artery you get a heart attack similarly you know i mean this is what we are doing right now you know you've got the developers will always drive you they always push us you know to provide minimum road network but that's an old thinking you know that's that's not the right way to go about it the right way to go about it is is to create an interconnected four way kind of network of streets so that you know a person who lives here can walk easily to the other point and he does not have to go around in the loop and go back to this point if you compare that with this particular diagram imagine you could be at any point And, and you could be living in any of these blocks you can move to any place easily within walking distance you don't have to rely upon car you don't have to rely upon your private automobile you know this becomes completely interconnected network whereas this one is where you know you can see things but you cannot cross you know i mean that's the kind of uh, difference that uh, ends up being and this is a diagram the the red dotted is how we sort of took that neighborhood broke that into uh, the next level the third principle is that after you establish these individual neighborhoods it's important to add that that focus to it and we do that by adding a neighborhood center this is an example of neighborhood center and the circles that you are seeing are 5 minute walking distance so what that means is that in this neighborhood every single house is within a 5 minute walking distance to that neighborhood center and that particular neighborhood center would have nothing fancy you know i mean i won't say clubhouse because that's that's a cliche you know that's a that's a gone thing what we're looking at is simple things like you know a small pocket park where your 8 year 9 year 10 year kid can play you know where mothers can watch you know uh, it could be a daycare center you know where you drop off your kids and you can go to the school you know um, it could be a senior center a, a small library a pharmacy or you know you're just a grocery store to bring your daily day to day needs uh, nothing fancy you know but it it's it's a neighborhood center you know that will just serve that particular neighborhood and we used to have these like nookar kind of this things uh, it's not like something very innovative we already used to have this into our uh, into our communities and then what we do is that after you inserted the neighborhood centers we we insert a heart we insert a town center and town center is something that is like a 20 minute walking distance this is a place where your bus will come drop you off the town center would look something like that where there's a formal plaza there's a shops restaurants cafe outdoor units maybe there's houses and everything faces onto the square that square village square that town square that becomes the individual uh, in individual element around which this entire community is based and and these are the examples these are some of the town centers that i have uh, designed i used to while i was in san francisco i was working on and and um, uh, thankfully you know this has taken almost uh, nine years to uh, get to this stage you know but uh, the project is moving at a very slow pace but things are getting developed and and just like new engine you know when you get it these things don't function so well i think people are very impatient it has to be oiled enough it has to sort of start uh, making sense and then the community start to work in 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 full mode um, the next principle is that create variety of parks and streets as public amenities again these are 5 minute distances and it is very important that you know often times in your in your due course of practice you would come across situations you know where there would be a part of land because of the site configuration where you cannot build your building and that's where the developer is going to force you to provide that 10% open space in fact we don't do that what we do is exactly opposite what we do is that we bring the parks and open spaces in the middle we make that a formal space you know it could be square rectangle uh, uh, whatever shape and we try to build around that and the beauty of it is that there's a premium now if you see this park 
and if you see the houses that overlook the park, you know, there's a, there's a hidden premium out there where the developer can easily charge maybe 20% more than the houses which do not look the park. So the question is that we didn't spend any more money than we should have. That 10% open space, any way we had to provide it, we are just doing it smartly, we are bringing it in the middle, and we are making that as a focus of the community. Uh, then the next feature, as I said, is that let parks and open spaces be the prominent feature for each neighborhood. This is one of our uh, uh, Nagpur project that we worked on. What we did was that we had to provide these open spaces. We provided this one and a half acre park, which had a neighborhood center, a daycare, you know, there was a little bit of formal element. But the best part about it was that there were all the houses that kind of overlooked that park. And, and a good park, you know, you, you visit any park, whether it's in India, abroad, a good edge condition is that when there's a human activity against the edge of that particular park, that is when it makes exciting. If it's a leftover space that we call as a park, then you know it's, it's very much a leftover space which is not maintained. No one would care to go. There would be instances of violence there uh, at night and so on and so forth. Imagine a park like that. Nobody can dare to misbehave, you know? I mean, there's everybody who's looking onto the park. There's a sense of security. Kids can walk around. You can actually, and, and we call this eyes on street, you know? So you can be in your house and you could be looking at your kids and, and human beings are social elements, are social animals, you know? We, we like to see people, we like to see activity. So we try to make that as a prominent feature for each of the neighborhood, uh, and this is what uh, this is another of neighborhood park that we designed uh, in Denver. And you can see uh, that's the 10% open space that was sort of allocated. And all these houses kind of overlooked that park. And in terms of landscape, this didn't take much, you know. I mean, it was just an extremely sophisticated way of approaching just a plain, simple lawn, couple of benches, lots of trees, and you sort of got your placemaking element in place. Uh, the, then the most important principle is enhance connectivity and walkability by designing pedestrian-friendly streets. Um, and that is one of, the, uh, one of the, uh, my pet peeves that I have. In fact, I just keep joking to my friends is that just like we have right to information, there should be right to walk in India or right to sidewalk. Because walking, the most basic amenity that, that, has, that nature has given us is not a dignified experience when you do that in India. In fact, if you're walking in India, you're a loser. I mean, people will honk at you, they'll blow horns at you, and, and where is the fun of walking, that you, whether you go to Singapore, London, uh, Paris, or all other places? So it's very important that walking, and, and you cannot just create walkability. In order to create that meaningful experience, it is important to create sidewalks that are wide enough. It is important that whenever there are gates, you have curb cuts, you know, so that people don't have to step up and down every time while they're walking along the sidewalk. It's wide enough so that three or four people can walk. There's enough trees so that there's shade, thermal comfort. The moment you start looking at all these different elements, that's when you start getting pedestrian-friendly street. And then this is the most important principle uh, that we as an architects can practice, and which is create a space through street wall and build-to-line configuration. It's amazing how some, some of the most simple things that we can learn from uh, our urban history which can be applied in this case of element. For instance, there's a plot, and when we put the building in the middle in some odd shape, that building does not engage the street. But just by bringing the street, uh, the building right to the edge, what you do is create a very strong uh, sort of edge condition along the street. And not because I'm saying this, but because this is how we have been uh, designing cities throughout, our, uh, throughout the generations. You know, you look at any of the world-class cities, we, we typically do these kind of research diagrams. So if you, these are, all the blacks are the building footprints, you know, the building floor plans. So if you look at the buildings, whether it's Barcelona or in Paris, all the public spaces, the amenities, are the ones, you know, which open out. And all the buildings are the ones which uh, sort of create a very nice sense of enclosure. Uh, another example of London, you know, uh, another city, New York. Uh, even places South Mumbai, you know, if you go to Kulaba and if you see these buildings, these are in a straight line along the street. They sort of create that 
uh, enclosure along the street, the way you see that uh, in, in places like Jaipur, it also in a country like ours provides the thermal comfort. And, and let me show you what that means. This is how our buildings are in current scenario. You know, every building is a great building by itself. You know, I mean, all our architects here, so I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, everybody does a great job, but overall fabric does not tie up together. So, you know, when we get a plot or a parcel like that, just by following one simple rule, the rule about street wall and build to line configuration, I'll show you how we can transform that space. You know, so you insert the first element, phase one, where you've got the buildings that line up, and there's a retail on the ground floor, and you've got this community space, like a park or a square in the middle. Then you insert your phase two, and you can now see it for yourself. These are existing buildings, and this is the new proposed development, where you see a very regular network of streets, open spaces, and uh, this thing in that particular hierarchy. Uh, and uh, there's an interesting story behind this slide because, you know, whenever in due course of our business development, we would go and talk to potential clients, developers, they all would be very excited uh, with what we would be showing. But the, the, the concern would be that we already have our architect on board. Uh, and, and that's when I felt that it was very important to get this message across that we are not there to compete against architect whether it's landscape architects, whether it's master planners, whether it's architects, we all are together as a community, you know, of, of developers, of designers, you know, and we essentially are not here to replace one another. And then I inserted these three interesting steps, you know, so what I said is that in the normal course of development, you know, a, a developer or a client goes with land acquisition, gets an architect. I'm talking about large scale sites, you know, 40 acre, 50 acre, 100, 500 acre, then they create their branding, marketing strategies, sales, project management, so on and so forth. I think where we come into picture are these invisible steps. You know, right when the land is acquired, what we do is we create, through visioning workshops, we create master plans. In other words, we are like script writers. You know, we write the script behind the background. Once the script and vision is created, then the developer can go and engage their favorite architects, whoever it is, and then the entire uh, uh, system can be developed into a, a very coherent and cohesive manner. So it's important to understand what is the process of community design and where does it begin for us as master planners. So what we traditionally do is that there's a very robust site inventory and site analysis that we do. Traditionally, these are you know, 50, 60, 80 page reports where we start to look at view corridors, we start to look at existing land uses, we look at opportunities, constraints, we look at connectivity, we look at topography, we do these kind of uh, topography terrain modeling, uh, we look at the existing vegetation, watersheds, hydrology, because that is what is really informs uh, our master planning process. It's not a diagram that we have in mind, we just come and superimpose, but, but the site itself gives all those hidden clues that we start to use at. The other important thing that we uh, have started doing is that we do design charrettes, or what we call visioning workshops. These are very important for the success of the project because as I said earlier, you know, it's the, the, the typical projects that we do range in horizon of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So it's very important that we engage all the stakeholders you know, who become our co-designers, you know, whether it's developer, his own internal architecture team, whether it's architects, uh, whether it's um, his marketing team, his branding team, everybody is partner into this thing. And what we do is we create a very focused format. And in that format, you know, we create these kind of basic brainstorming stations through which, you know, we establish the basic master planning ideas. And once that is done, this is the output that you get out of that workshop where we create these different master planning alternatives. And then each of alternatives is worked out for structure, circulation, building footprints, land use, zoning, so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, the next step is when the final master plan is done, we start to look at parcelization plan, we look at zoning plan, we develop a street typology, because not every street is the same. You know, we, we develop a, a primary street, a secondary street, all that typology, uh, building types, you know, building heights, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go, and now what I spoke about earlier was more of an approach, the methodology. I'm just going to show real quick some of the projects that we're working on and how we've been able to apply these principles towards creating a community. We've been working on this 250-acre uh, township uh, 
project at Shirwal for Chodia. And I'm not going to go through the entire report. I'm just going to go real quick and you know, try to explain uh, as, as early as possible because I'm conscious of the time uh, that it needs to be done. Uh, so I'm constantly under your watch, I know that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, traditionally we do these kind of uh, mapping, you know, which uh, helps us understand that within 25 kilometer uh, uh, driving shade or within 50 kilometer shade, what are important elements. And there's a complete report that we've done on site analysis. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I'm just going to skip all that part. Uh, but I, what I felt is that it's important that I talk about visioning workshops. Uh, and, and the entire outcome behind the workshop is that we insist developers to involve everybody on their team. And once they become the co-participants in the workshop, we prepare well in advance by creating a very strong site analysis. And then we do joint site visit with the entire team. Uh, architects are involved in this process, landscape architects, you know, uh, financial feasibility guys, bankers, institutes, and, and the entire developer team. Uh, then in session two, once we come back, we, we traditionally hire like a big banquet hall to do these kind of workshops because it's very important to set up that kind of infrastructure to do that. Then we start with site analysis and existing conditions analysis. In session three, we present case studies and benchmarks. That is very important because one needs to understand uh, the good and the bad examples that are there out there which are built. So you get to learn a lot from that. Then we talk about the principles of community design that I just spoke about, those eight, 10 principles. Then we have this brainstorming session. And in this session, we don't draw. We act merely as facilitators. What we do is we take this group of 30, 40 people, we split them into three, four, five different groups. We assign them a table, we assign them a base map, and we actually encourage them to draw draw out their vision by discussing things internally. And these are not technical people like us. These are not technical people who, who, who don't know how to draw. And once they have done that, we ask them to pin up their drawings so that you know, we get the feedback. And then we get the conclusion recommendations. And that's when our role begins. You know? So I, I just feel I'll show an example of what that looks like. So this is a joint site visit. This is a site analysis finding that we are presenting. This is the case studies benchmark session three that we present to show some examples of developments. Uh, and this is the actual brainstorming session. These are not architects, but this is more from client side. This is the pinup review. And these are the drawings which are done by the clients. You know, these are not the drawings done by architects. These are not the drawings done by master plan. And you can see the amazing consistency that you see in each of these three ideas because we were able to give them sessions and educate them on community building, they were able to create a very accurate uh, vision of what they wanted. And then we took that and started applying our master planning expertise, creating a framework plan. And this is how the final master plan evolved. Uh, this is a 250-acre site. I won't go into detail. That's an employment center. You arrive, but notice the parks the green open system, everywhere it's in the middle, there are courtyards. It's a courtyard typology that we've used for all the housing. There's a street wall that we've created. And these are 20 minute and five minute, 10 minute walking distances from the park. So it's all very scientific the way we do that. We map it, you know, so that, you know, it's not because I, Swapnil, like something fancy that I draw a curved line. No, it's, it's the principles that, that very much guide this uh, process. This is the street network, and as I said earlier, this is an interconnected network of streets, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. You don't see any dead ends. You can be at any point, and you're moving around. You get multiple choices. The traffic also gets distributed accordingly. You can see the building footprints. They create a very nice condition along the street when you're walking because you buildings on both sides. It provides a shade and more of a thermal comfort. And then we get into you know, the, the FSI diagram. So e, uh, I mean, each block is assigned an FSI, you know, the number of flows, um, the, uh, so on and so forth. And then th we create very high level urban massing studies. You know? For instance, this is a town center. There are two signature towers. There's a square along which you know, you've got buildings. There are individual courtyard typology. All that is developed within that. We don't do architecture at this stage. You know? The whole idea is to look at bird's eye view, uh, which is what this is. And this is the entire view along the NH4, how the township would look like. Uh, and, and then, you know, we use these kind of, as I said earlier, cartoon-like place-making illustrations. This shows, if you noticed one thing, architecture acts as a backdrop to the human activity. You know, it's the human beings, it's the people, it's the foreground, 
it's all these elements that sort of make it a lot more spatial and not just buildings. Uh, this is the example of the neighborhoods. As I said earlier, this is where the, the community would be. You know, your kids would be happy playing here in the foreground. There are trees. The buildings sit nicely. So building is not a standalone individual object that is detached from the community. It blends well into the community. And that's what we've been trying to show here. Another of such uh, visualization. Um, I think I still have five minutes. Uh, OK. Um, so this is a, another, I, I showed something at a 220 acre, a, a relatively large scale, though you know, we've done projects ranging in 2,000 acre. Now I'm getting to 65 acre, a slightly smaller scale. This is a master planning scale. And I, I just want to show example. We again do these kind of studies to understand the site, the existing urban fabric around. And then this was the outcome of the visioning workshop. This is, again, the clients you know, who were able to draw up and do these kind of accurate diagramming. After all the discussions, we were able to finalize alternative radial plan, which was this alternative. And we end up doing these kind of diagrams. You know, for us, the AutoCAD drawing comes last. That's the last thing we do. What is more important is that we do a lot of these kind of illustrations. For instance, Noli was this Roman architect uh, back in, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I believe 680, who did an entire mapping of Rome in which he just showed these building blocks. You know, and all the white that you see, these are negative and these are positive. All the positive spaces are actually the public spaces. By doing this kind of diagram, you understand how public spaces are reinforced and what human activity is put inside. This is an example where these are all building footprints. And look at the building footprints. They nicely come along the street edge. They form a uniform street. They frame the uh, public parks and open spaces. They frame the courtyards. So, and, and the amenity building is completely like Frank Gehry. You know, it does not follow this rule. It does not follow this street wall kind of thing. It can be a crazy, weird, Zahahadi kind of expression, whatever it wants to be. But when it comes to community and housing, that's when we need to control. Because by and large, it's like when you're doing an interior design project, you address the needs of client. When you're designing, let's say, a 60-acre community, the entire town is your client. So it becomes very important that you address all their needs on that front. Uh, and this is what the site plan looks like. So this is a town square, two high-rise towers. Along the town square, we provided a structured parking garage. This is a formal square. Along that axis, there was a clock tower where there were civic amenities in terms of a library and a hospital. And then, you know, very simple way of finding. You can be in this community, and you kind of know where to head. You know, the streets are straight. You see down the line. And everywhere, you know, we call this origin and destination. So when you're moving from this point, from the origin to destination, a destination is a park. From this origin, when you move to that destination, that is a park. From there, when you move to another this thing, there's a park. You know, it could be park or a civic amenity or public this thing, but everywhere there's a public amenity that becomes that sort of element. And this is what the town square looks like. Again, you know, we've not done architecture, but it's enough to give the hint. Notice how the buildings are expressed. You know, this is a Vancouver Tower typology. Even when it comes to high rises, the Manhattan Tower would be very much different from your Vancouver Tower, which would be very different from your London Tower. And in Vancouver Tower, what you do is that there's a base, very strong building, and the tower is expressed completely different, you know, and that's the middle part. And at the top part, the building is kind of recessed and goes back. It's like a crown that sits on the, on the tower. And it's very important how towers are to be designed. You know, they, they, it requires a certain delicacy in, in how you do that. Uh, even for the buildings, you know, if you look at the dark band, that is the ground floor retail. You know, that's the base of the building. The middle three floors is the middle of the building, and the top floor, which is like a penthouse floor, that's recessed back. And this is not something that we've done innovatively. Look at Paris. You know, if you look at all the buildings there, every building, Kulaba, you go, that follows that base, middle, top principle, and that's what makes civic architecture a uh, lot more interesting. And then we get into street network and circulation. So that's a primary network, that's a secondary and tertiary network. Um, and then we do these kind of visualizations, you know, which shows the community, the parks, the green roofs, you know, and, and the architecture, very simple rhythm of windows, doors, and the expression. We don't want to create too many weird objects out there because then it becomes a complete chaos. Uh, so the idea is to create, these are the row houses that sort of face onto the park. Uh, 
and then this is a diagram that shows the parks and open space network. So all the pale green is what we see as you know, your neighborhood parks. These are small pocket parks. These are individual courtyards. And all are connected together through trees and uh, these kind of things. That we've, I've already spoke about this one, um, some of the building uh, uh, architectural character. And we, show, we, we, we say that that would be the character that would be, go into these kind of buildings, uh, looking at row house types. And this was the original design that developer had come to us with. You know, I mean, uh, he had got this design done. And when you look at these two diagrams, you can tell the difference. We have not lost any FSI. We've consumed more or less, not, not more or less. In fact, we've consumed everything to the same degree. But you look at this plan where, you know, there's this sector kind of thing, you know. So there's this sector of uh, villas. There's a sector of, um, you know, I mean, premium apartments. And these are all the civic buildings. We took that same program and we integrated that into our design into far more uh, cohesive kind of community. And you uh, kind of understand that through these uh, things. This is again, you know, that same original design, the way it was, and you can see what we were able to do that and transform that more into community kind of uh, idea. Uh, incidentally, this project won us Hadko Award last year as the most innovative township design in India. So that's that sort of added recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do I? I'm, I'm out of time? Okay. Uh, thanks, Sapnil, for that uh, very fast and uh, very, uh, what you can, can call, express uh, kind of presentation. To create that uh, uh, public areas, the plaza, the central park, in the area that was uh, close to the river. Now, uh, there were uh, arguments for and argument against both this, you know, from the public. But one important thing that I want to stress is whatever was being discussed was introduced as a part of a school curriculum for the school children. You know, we are students of architecture or we are architects. Now, what they did there, the mayor, you know, they Sir, uh, please, yeah. very short and brief. Yeah, we they had introduced time. this in the um, school curriculum so that the people are, the students themselves at school age, they are aware of the uh, vision of the city. Uh, so that's uh, one thing. And the second thing is, even IIA uh, head office that we have at uh, Mumbai, in those areas also we had this kind of uh, the research buildings wherein a person does not feel claustrophobic and it gives a sense of openness. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, architect Nilesh Savan. Any more yeah, questions? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, architect Degwekar is asking one question. Sir, you must have visited old Nagpur city while planning the township in Nagpur. I am of the firm opinion that extraordinary discipline, road network and planning makes formal behavior. And old Nagpur city where there, there is informal planning and not discipline in the road network, they are more informal in nature, more cohesive, and the more culture is sustainable in the old city of Nagpur. And you will not find such type of culture in such type of planned development, where even walking, in the, walking on the street or moving in the park has become a formal. So to sum up this session, a very fast and very small session. Yeah, Sony sir, please. We're talking about designing communities. And unless you involve the community itself in finding out what they want, because uh, whatever uh, experience you have shown, your own experiences, it seems that you have only uh, probably discussed all issues threadbare with the developers. What about the people who are actually going to come and stay there? And unless there is some way of uh, public participation, I think these kinds of efforts, they only remain on paper. They look good on paper, but in real life, they don't actually appear <laughs> as we have expected, you know, uh, as we have anticipated them, them to be. Yeah, yeah. 
that's, that's a very good question, and it's not so much of a question, but more of an observation. Um, actually, what I showed here, it's interesting because when I came back to India, the choices were very limited, you know, either to focus on public sector, you know, which is what I've been doing all this while in US, where we do these charades and workshops, where there are these town hall style meetings, we have stakeholder engagement. That's what I've been doing for 12 years, whether it's Abu Dhabi or US. I chose to, I wouldn't say get my hands dirty, but get into private sector because that's where you can start to make the change. See, the public agencies are going to work at their own pace. The stakeholder engagement, we are likely to be getting empaneled on Pune street design. We would be doing a lot of those consultations. But it's the developers, you know, who make that decision making in silo, in isolation. And that's where we started this workshop process to solicit that kind of feedback. So it's not the top promoter, the guy who's sitting there making decisions, but his entire office, if not the community, where his office boy, his marketing guy, the guys who are going to go there and sell his product are involved in providing their feedback and decision making. I think that's more of an innovation that we've tried to do, which was very different from having one-on-one -on -one engagement of an architect with the developer himself directly, and rest of the office just follows the drill. We, we try to break that mold, and, and we are finding a lot of encouraging response to do that. So yes, to answer your question, I think the time has come, the idea is there. I think it's the public sector, the municipal uh, cities that need to step up, create a wider outreach of stakeholders, which we've been doing all the time. It's only something that is missing in India. So yes, I, I kind of agree. Yeah, now three questions, uh, everything is over. So to sum up this, uh, what Sapnil shows us a very simple method from uh, neighborhood to everything, uh, to create a neighborhood to everything in a walkable distance. Hence, create a smart uh, township, what uh, I guess from his uh, entire speech. And uh, hence, uh, henceforth, uh, put uh, one step forward for a smart cities. Thank you. Architect one Samir Gokhale. We had it all in this session, from green architecture to urban designing. Everything was covered in this session. Hope you all have enjoyed this session. Dignitaries on the dais and dignitaries of the dais, we would like to thank architect Rahul and Supriya Rawat, Gangotri Architects. Your presentation regarding practical, sustainable architecture and experience sharing was a great journey through the work you have carried out for betterment of eco-friendly architecture. We would also like to thank architect Swapnil Patil for his time to present the lecture on art and science of master planning and urban development. This will be an eye-opener for many architects for futuristic urban designs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to request you to felicitate the speakers. Architect Rahul Rawat and Supriya Rawat. Gangotri Architects Pune. IIA Sangli Center, thank you for the presentation. Swapnil Patil, thanks a lot on behalf of IIS Sangli Center for a wonderful presentation. We also thank the chairman of both the sessions, architect Girija Kulkarni, chairman IIA Kolapur Center. She is also the principal of Kalaprabodhini College, Kolapur. Thanking architect Nilesh Tavan, chairman IIA Nasik Center.